evening. Good evening, family. Welcome <clears throat> to the Solution Group Anniversary Meeting. Um, my name is Pamela, and my sobriety date is February 3rd, 2020. And I'm a member of this group, and I also go to Alpha and Tyler, Texas. And uh, when COVID hit, I had just gotten sober on February 3rd. Everything in Tyler shut down. I had nowhere to go. I had to come to this Zoom thing. And I can tell you today, I'm two years sober because of this, because of Ricky Russell, Gary Kincaid. There's a few of us that started to go, oh my God, Angela, Teresa. And that's, this is magical. Thank you for, it's an honor that I get to do this. And so I'm going to, um, good. I'm going to, this is what Teresa told me I had to say. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Big Book Solution Group on Zoom. We are glad that you could attend the second anniversary. We hope that you enjoy what we have planned for you, what we have scheduled tonight. The chat, the chat feature will be turned off for the duration of the meeting and you will remain muted to avoid any background noise. Let's get started. I'd like to start us off with the serenity prayer and a moment of silence. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thank you. <clears throat> Alcoholics Anonymous Preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organizations, or institutions. We do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help the next alcoholic to achieve sobriety. Thank you. Um, Gary K is going to share a little bit of our group's history. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Gary Kincaid. And I am really, 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 really grateful for a sobriety date and for a new life. It started July 25th of 94. And actually, I'm going to be very uh, short. Uh, around March the 10th, something like that, of 2020, Ricky gave me a call and said, what do you think about starting a Zoom meeting? And my response was, what the hell is Zoom? Uh, I didn't have a clue about it. Hell, I didn't even know my computer had a camera on it. But I got a hold of my IT tech, and my granddaughter came over here, got me hooked up pretty good. The only thing I'll say about both the history is when Ricky and I were talking, we wanted to make a format-driven meeting. Uh, we want it to be a big book solution meeting. So the readings come from the preface, any of the forewords, doctor's opinion, first 11, uh, well, the 11 chapters of the big book, nothing from the stories, nothing from any other source. And the chairperson, as y'all noted uh, through the couple of years, they don't say, this is why I picked this or anything. They just read the reading and then call on people. And that format has been fantastic. But what makes this meeting has been like every bit of AA. It's about people loving people. And it's been the people who've been committed to it. If you're new on here, one thing that this group has done from the beginning, we get and we use the phone number. You know, the group has not depended on a meeting-based sobriety. It's been call people, get out of yourself, get in touch. And most of you know 
the excitement that's come into your life as part of being in this group the last couple of years has been from the friendship. When we've truly joined shoulder to shoulder so that others might rediscover life. That goes on in AA. So I don't call this Zoom AA or brick and mortar AA. We've only got one AA. And this is what we've got tonight. And I'll finish by saying this. Some of you who've done a little bit of talking on Zoom know it's a hell of a lot easier to tell your story when you're looking at other people's faces. So when Mickey gets started, please don't turn your cameras off. Leave them on uh, so she can see who she's sharing with. Thank you all for the way you really, really, really. Actually, the last two years have been some best AA I've ever been a part of in my life. Y'all are a huge part of that. That's all, Pamela. Thanks. Thank you, Gary K. Angela F. Will you share your experience with the Solution Group, please? Thank you, Pamela, and thank you for sharing, baby. Hi, everybody. My name is Angela Fontenot. I'm an alcoholic Lebanese redneck, and I'm grateful to be here. My sobriety date is March the 11th of 1987, and I'm from Belton, Mississippi, the heart of the Delta, and the catfish, capital of the world. My essay is titled, My Experience with This Group. My Mississippi 2B sister could sell ice cubes to a snowman. I was two weeks without a meeting, and I was whining, so it was one of those, you're going to do this moments. Uh, you are going to do it. Whoever it was that put AA meetings on Zoom for the pandemic is a huge hug from me. With a lot of patience on her part, I was introduced to Zoom. So every day I was all over the world. I went to Ireland and Missouri and New Zealand and South Africa and Nevada. On any hour, on any day, there was a meeting. I would plug in in the morning and stay plugged in all day day long. I was loving it. Then she calls me to tell me about this flower she got in the mail, and she said, it sounds like a good meeting. We better go. So I met her that night, and the first meeting, that meeting was in Texas, and it was this group. It was like my very first AA meeting that I ever went to in my life. It had a feeling. There was an energy. I was hooked. And it was different. This meeting was about the first 164 pages of the big book, period. They didn't care how my day went. I had never in my life been exposed to such a thing. So I was intrigued. Every person shared from the heart. Every person really loved sobriety and deeply respected that book. They knew the book. But better than that, they knew the history that was in the book. And that snared me. That was it. And once again, <clears throat> I found myself wanting what another alcoholic had. The meetings were structured, each one different and fresh. Lots of laughter at ourselves. Once they tried to convince me I had an accident. <laughs> With time, I have learned to say, right I have always loved alcoholics all my life. The Big Book Solution Group is full of people I love. They are my family. My Mississippi sister and I are all in when it comes to this group. We travel to attend their state convention, their local convention, and the group instills such a love of history for us that we drove all the way to New York, New York City <laughs> to to meet them and tour the place where Bill Wilson lived and walked and died. And each one shared knowledge and that sense of wonder with us even now. One of our members made this statement one night, come all the way in, sit all the way down and stay. And another member reminded me that alcoholism is like sex with a gorilla. It ain't over till he says it's over. By logging in on March 2020, I found home 
and it's always good to be home. Thank you for letting me share with y'all. I love you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. You're one of my favorites. God, I love you. <clears throat> John Charles Ellis. Will you share with us, please? You're darn right. Right? Right? I'm John Charles Ellis, and I am an alcoholic. This Friday date is September 6, 2020. My home group is the Fellowship Group in Jacksonville, Texas. And you are my Zoom buddies. I'll tell you, when I first heard about this, I was whining like a little baby. Damn, that COVID's got all these damn groups shut down, and I travel all over the state. And uh, the wizard's little brother, Ricky Russell, he said, John, you got to get on this Zoom. I said, Zoom, how do you get on it? Well, you got a password. You got this. I'm like, and he gave me the information and shot it to me. And I got on here. At the beginning, I think it was, oh, probably three, four months into my sobriety. I just got a sponsor. And I'll tell you, every night at 8 o'clock, no matter I'm in Pecos, Odessa, Midland, South Texas, Central, wherever I'm at, I can just whip out my laptop and I can find my family right here. I learned a lot here. I've got my 19 month sobriety, but I've really, really dug into sticking to the big book, staying on top, learning about resentments, and not letting the fear run my life. I learned it from a lot of the big gurus up here. One's in a black jacket over here with that long hair. Another one's Ricky Russell. I got, wet, I got West Coast and East Coast people that I can call at any time, and they will give me insight, a little bit different angles, like Bobby Forbes. I've got surrounded by friends. I was invited to go visit with them in New York. State conventions, this one, Georgetown, we were down there. We just, we have kept this friendship together. Uh, Mesa, Arizona. We have, we have met in retreats, and we are still going strong. And then Mickey came and spoke at our, at our fellowship group in Jacksonville. Holy shit, when I found, she found out she was coming on this thing, I said, I got to get on here. So thank you so much for what you've done for me and my sobriety. And that my sobriety is, is a lot of it's due to this group right here. The women's side of it how to deal with my wife. I can call Teresa. I call the ladies. If I got problems with my brothers, I can call. I can get all different angles of information where I didn't even know existed. I've got friends now like I've never had before. True friends that speak the truth. At least they tell me they are. I, don't know. <laughs> I love each and every one of you. Mickey, it's good to see you and everybody that's here. Thank you. You're muted. muted, Pamela. Wouldn't be a Zoom beating without that. Keep, keep me straight. Keep me straight. John Charles Ellis, we love you to death. We're just glad that you're alive and here. Uh, the next person that's going to speak, see, when COVID hit, me, Henry, and Bill T were desperate. And Henry's fixing to share, and his sobriety date is two days before mine. His is February 1st, and mine's February 3rd. And we were both in bad shape. See, this disease was killing us. We didn't have nowhere to go. But we found this, and the, the most amazing thing is that we still come all the time, even though other meetings have opened, and, and we still just, oh, we just love the Zoom Solution Group. So, Henry, can we hear from you, buddy? Sure thing. Thank you, Pamela. I'm Henry, and I am an alcoholic. And by the grace of God in this program, I've been sober since February the 1st of 2020, and that is a miracle and nothing but the grace of God. You know, I can't believe it's been two years. Uh, amazing, you know. 
just try to get a quick rundown on kind of what this group did for me to start with the thing that sticks in my mind that I remember being pointed out to me where most of y'all know my story. I've been, I've been around the block or two with AA in and out, uh, basically really from 91 until, uh, 2012. Um, other than some few day relapse after a few year dry stretch, but just, you know, wasn't really the, all that content and happy with my sobriety not always, but most of the time it was not all that good because, you know, these things were, that were told me were suggestions. Uh, um, I'm the hardest man in any room I walk into and I don't need somebody's suggestions from 1939 that wrote a book, you know, then, you know, I just know even the, the doctor opinion, why I need to listen, why do I need to read a doctor's opinion from way back in that era? I mean, my God, I'm, I know today I'm smarter than him. I don't need his opinion. And I don't need your suggestions. I'll do this my way. Thank you. Um, and it wasn't until I got into this group that I'd hear people like Ricky Russell pointing out uh, later on clear cut directions, precisely how we recovered. And, and lines like that begin to sink in through my thick skull that, you know, m maybe there's something to these uh, uh, suggestions, you know, M maybe they carry a little more weight than, uh, uh, than what I was giving them. And so I kind of latched on and some of the things I started to see then were that, you know, there were some definite themes running through this text that, you know, uh, the problem is me, uh, self-centeredness, selfishness, you know, and all the manifestations of that, the way they tied in, it's repeated over and over. I started underlining my book in these meetings. How many times does it use this word or variations of this word? They must be trying to tell me something. And, you know, and the next thing that started coming through was I began hearing over and over again things that I'd never heard because I always kind of thought, you know, 12 steps kind of for extra credit anyway, you know, and I'm really a busy man with an important life. So as long as I'm not drinking today, then I am successful in this program. Um, and uh, my friend Harry that's on here now, of course, I was hearing it before, you know, stressed over and over again, how constant thought of others, working with others, you know, whether it's actually in a sponsorship role, but, but that is the key to my freedom from this bondage of self. And um, Harry had me go through the book for our little study we do in Forest over there and, um, and find all these references other than in working with others that talk about the importance of working with others. And, um, and I was kind of mind boggled when I put it all together and, you know, in this two page sheet, all these references put together really, wow, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, it's in every step. If I look for it, you know, to keep it short, down to step nine, my real, uh, uh, our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and to people about us, you know, and that's at step nine. So it's getting me all the way to step for everything in there, you know, is, is, is loading the cannon ready to fire, you know, and then, you know, I'd load the cannon and then let it sit there until water got in the barrel, you know. It got wet. It just never quite worked all that well. But um, I'm kind of in with this. It's something that come up. I was talking with my friend Bobby about because there's been so many here that um, like to share that's given me a new perspective. He had asked me a question a year or so ago. Well, what what's different now, Henry? You know what I mean? You've had all this time around the program before. What what is different? And um, other than some of the things that I shared then. Um, I'll have to share this. 1994, two and a half years away from my last drink, uh, I wound up in a charter hospital, suicidal, um, had just blowed up the first family, you know, through, through my self-centered behavior, not drinking, without a drop of alcohol, you know, I, I could, I could accomplish this. Um, you know, and the other thing I thought about was from 1991, that second treatment until 2000 and, uh, 12, when I went out for my eight years of additional field research, I was around AA the majority of that time. And not once, not once did anyone ever ask me to sponsor them. In the last year, I've had half a dozen people ask me to sponsor them. Okay. So, um, I think the difference was that, you know, attending and participating in my recovery 
which looked like going to meetings and puking up my problems, had people looking at me and say, there's a man with a problem. Yeah, I think I'll ask him to sponsor me, right? Um, where today, with y'all having shown me a solution, um, I'm not out there, you know, recruiting sponsees. I just come to a meeting with the solution I was given and the excitement I have about it. And the next thing you know, somebody says, would you sponsor me? So I'm like, wow, you know what I mean? There's what's different. There's what's different, Bobby. Thank you so much. This 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 group here just means means the world to me. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. I'm so glad you're here, buddy. <clears throat> you're not on the uh, itinerary, but Bill Turner, I cannot not call on you because it was me, Bill Turner, and Henry that were desperate. And Bill Turner walked out of rehab. He's from Mount Pleasant, Texas, and he didn't know what to do. And he got on this group, and now he's a GSR in Mount Pleasant. Can you go? Can you imagine that? Take it away, Bill Turner. Oh, gosh, man. I'm going to let y'all down horribly. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I am Bill Turner. I am an alcoholic. My Friday date is March 20th of 2020. Yeah, uh, I'm in Mount Pleasant, Texas. I'm halfway between Greenville and Texarkana on Interstate 30. Uh, good to be here. Uh, Pam sent me a note. Uh, please show up tonight. And, and I am so sorry, folks. I haven't been here in quite a while. It's probably been over a month. Uh, just been doing some a lot of things here in Mount Pleasant. We've been trying to really get the groups growing. We have several things going out here. Uh, I really can't even begin to really start with what happened. Uh, I had a 46 uh, year drinking career. Uh, I started, I got drunk my first time when I was 13 years old. And uh, my birthday was yesterday. <laughs> and on my 18th birthday of yesterday, uh, I bought my first six pack of beer at 18 years old because that's when the legal age was in Texas. And that was the first thing I did when the, uh, the convenience store opened up. I went down and bought my first six pack. Well, I spent the next 46 years doing everything I can to drink. And uh, I, I was, uh, I consider what's called a successful drunk. I was able to drink and, and take care of business and, uh, until I couldn't take care of business. And uh, on March 20th of 2020, I went into uh, rehab. Uh, I was still in rehab at this time that the solutions groups had started. Uh, I didn't get out till 19th of April of 2020. And uh, I, and like uh, Pam said, you know, we were all faced with uh, uh, COVID. Uh, the outbreak was occurring. It was just really starting to rear its ugly head. And I had an employer mandate that I had to do 90 meetings in 90 days. I said, how am I going to do that? All the meetings are shut down. And uh, I got involved in, a, in some groups uh, locally in Dallas. And uh, and then a guy called me and said, uh, hey, I uh, heard you're a friend of uh, Bill W's. <laughs> and uh, that was Gary Kay. And so I met Gary Kay at the local uh, McDonald's here in town. And he got me involved in this group learned a lot of things. I mean, this is the, the first time I'd even opened Alcoholics Anonymous, the, the, the big book. Uh, I'd never gotten involved in Alcoholics Anonymous at any time in my life. Uh, I was one of those uh, gentleman drinkers that I thought I could handle it and, uh, until I couldn't handle it. And uh, where I became uh, basically drinking morning, noon, and night. I couldn't even do my job, couldn't even get out of bed. Uh, uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, basically, it just uh, physically and mentally fall apart. But that road to recovery started right here. It started right here with the handful of us, uh, Pam and uh, Henry, Ricky, uh, uh, Gary. Uh, there, there's a few here that are not here tonight. Uh, I stay in touch with some of them. They are still sober. One of them was Todd. Todd just had his second year uh, anniversary on the 30th uh, of March, and uh, I gave him a call. He's doing very well. Uh, told him about this, but uh, uh, it's been a journey. Uh, 
And, and uh, like Henry said, you know, there's things in the book that I have to focus on. And daily, I have to pull things out. I have to read. Uh, page 86, uh, waking up in the morning, page 62. And then and page 40, you know, 45. There is, you know, I have a dilemma. And uh, it's those things that I, I continue to go back to. And, and read and reread again and stay involved in meetings and stay involved with uh, my fellow alcoholics and calling them and uh, stay involved with the, the community here in Mount Pleasant. It, it's a small group, but we, we continue to grow. We continue to have people come in. And uh, I'm so thankful that I am able to, to provide service to them and bring that message to other alcoholics. Uh, if we didn't have the doors open, you know, uh, nobody would have a place to go. And I certainly understand that, and I, I will do anything and everything I can to make sure that I keep that door open. And I have that key in my pocket, and it's always with me. If there's uh, anybody that, you know, that needs to have a meeting, I'm here. So good to be here. Congratulations on two years, guys. Uh, that's all I got. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Bill. I'm glad you're here. <clears throat> Mr. Jackie B., we, he's going to read something from the solution reading from the big book, please, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Jackie Babb. I'm an alcoholic. Um, this is from chapter two. There is a solution. The bottom of that page, page 17. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. Love God. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Jackie B. I'm glad you're here, buddy. All righty. Simon G., my buddy. Can we hear from you, sweetie? Sure. My name is Simon Gustus, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm from Mesa, Arizona. And uh, my sobriety date is October 29th of 2020. My reading is um, from page 18 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution, who is properly, properly armed with facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Thank you. Stephanie, can I hear from you, sweetie? You're, Stephanie's going to read from the big book also. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie. I'm an alcoholic. July 1st, 2014 is my sobriety date, and I live in Charleston, South Carolina. And this is from page 25. There is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others, and we had come to believe in the hopelessness and the futility of life as we had been living it. When, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. Thank you, Stephanie. Teresa R is gonna introduce our speaker, but I have to say Teresa has been here from almost the beginning. She's the one who put this all together. She's been the backbone, the love, Thank you, Teresa, for all you do for us crazy alcoholics. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela, but I can't take any credit. It was our sister, Ricky, who did it all. <laughs> I'm Teresa, and I am an alcoholic. Happy two years to our Zoom room. <laughs> My sobriety date is November 20th of 2007. And I live in Pearl, Mississippi, and my home group's in Jackson, Mississippi. And I get the great honor of introducing our guest speaker tonight. And uh, 
luckily we're not like them other ones that only give her 20 minutes and then keep our mics open. Um, I understand that Nikki is a bit of an outlaw or has been a bit of an outlaw, but she's, she's uh, gone to great measures to go from being an outlaw to being a grateful contributing member of our society and their society. And uh, I got to hear Mickey because uh, she was speaking on my sober anniversary on 11, 2021 in the round Robin in Jacksonville, Texas. The thing is, if you go, if you go into a room where she's a guest speaker, you may be having a hard time finding her because she's one that'll grab a ladle and slap an apron on and start serving gumbo with the rest of us. And, um, she will be coming to Pearl in the end of August, along with Gary. And uh, I was concerned. I said, well, what about your 90-year-old mother? And she said, girl, all my AFA friends cover my mother up. And she said, sometimes I've come home and caught them cheating on me and visiting with my mother and not with me. <laughs> so we're in for a treat tonight, and I want to give her as much time as possible. So... I, I give you Miss Mickey B. You're on, Mickey. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name's Mickey. I'm a real alcoholic. And I've been sober by God's grace since February 5th of 1987. And I want to thank you, Teresa, for that wonderful introduction. I enjoyed visiting with you on the phone the other day. And I want to thank Ricky for always hooking me up, doing these things. I really have not liked talking on Zoom much anymore because you kind of feel like you're talking to yourself, you know? The last time I spoke, the guy on the screen fell asleep and was nodding, and that kind of, you know, is disheartening. But I'll do anything for Ricky Russell. So, you know, and I, I always have and I always will, and, and I, I know he'll do the same for me. And thank you, Ricky, for asking about my mom, you know? Um, I'm so grateful, you know, two weeks before COVID hit, I moved into a new house that I built right next door to my mom. And uh, she, she'll be 90 years old in August. She's got a lot of health problems right now. Was just recently diagnosed with uh, multiple myeloma. So we're battling that among other health problems that she has. And I'm so grateful that I'm able to be a good daughter to the woman who means so much to me, you know? And I owe that all to Alcoholics Anonymous. And my mother loves Alcoholics Anonymous and everybody in it. You know, her door is always open to us. And like Teresa said, I'll call my mom sometime and ask her what she's doing. And my friends are over there visiting with her. So they all just love her. And, you know, she's just wonderful. And I, I can't thank you enough. And I really enjoyed listening to everybody who shared before the meeting. You know, uh, it just reminded me and, and what stuck in my head is I'm so grateful that I wasn't able to just get sober on my own. You know, thank God I couldn't do it. Thank God I was put into a program of Alcoholics Anonymous that has allowed me to, to make sense of the past and, and free me for a future and not be bound by those resentments, that fear, that, you know, those horrible things that happen. And, and I, I'm just so grateful. Uh, my home group is the Hearn Happy Hour group in Hearn, Texas. Some of y'all probably don't know where Hearn is. Uh, I live in Bryan College Station. Some of you know where Texas A&M University is. Uh, I'm in the hood side in Bryan. And I go a little bit further down hood. To, Hearn, Texas, and uh, I graduated high school there, took my first drink there, and that's where my home group is. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, not just because I go in and take a seat every now and then or Zoom every now and then, but uh, I have service commitments. I have a sponsor. I am a sponsor. I sponsor a lot of women right now, and, you know, I'm so grateful for, for them coming into my life when, when uh, you know, they always come when I need them. And I, I was thinking, too, you know, um, all my life I thought I was doomed to live the life I was living. And it was, I thought, you know, I was raised with that, that saying, well, you made your bed and I'll lie in it. And I lied in that bed for a long, long time. And thank God Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how to change the sheets. You know, taught me I could buy a new bedroom set if I wanted to, that I don't have to lay in that and be another statistic. You know, I'm so grateful for that. 
So anyway, I am will soon be 67 years old in October. Um, I live alone in my home. I am fully self-supporting through my own contributions. I have not been married since I've been sober. Um, my sponsor told me I never had to get married again if I didn't want to, and I haven't found it necessary. Uh, I've had some serious relationships, and when I love, I love. And I've had my heart broken and all that, so when the last one ended, I just went and bought a new Harley. And I, I, it starts when I want it to, it stops when I want it to, and, uh, you know, I know where it is every night. So uh, I really enjoy the life that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me and that God of my understanding has allowed me to have. I feel so spoiled. I, I really do. I just feel like, like a spoiled individual because I, I just have so many blessings from so many different directions and I can never repay what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me and my family. I had my granddaughter here last weekend and my, my daughter was here and you know, Thank God I don't get what I deserve. I, I mean that sincerely. Thank God I don't get what I deserve. So anyway, I'll tell a little bit about what it was like and what happened and what it's like now, um, which is awesome and wonderful and um, certainly not deserving. You know, it's just grace and mercy of a loving God. I started drinking when I was um, 12 years old. It, I was in Hearn, Texas. Not a lot to do in Hearn, Texas. And, uh, you know, there was a lot wrong with me before I ever took that first drink. I started lying as soon as I could talk. I started stealing as soon as I could walk. And I had this sister who was three years older than me, God rest her soul. And she, uh, she was a straight A student. She was the class favorite. She was the cheerleader. And on Friday nights, while she was cheering the football team on, I was in the parking lot stealing hubcaps. You know, I wasn't good at getting positive attention, but I was good at getting negative attention. And if you're a kid like me, starving for attention, um, you know, negative attention is better than no attention. And so um, my, my father was in the military and we lived overseas and we lived all over the place and ended up in Hearn, Texas. Um, my mother has family there. And so we ended up there, and uh, my father was a wife-beating, child-beating alcoholic. And when I was about 10 years old, my mother gave him the ultimatum to quit drinking or leave. And he left. And for all my years prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought my father left because he chose alcohol over his family, that he didn't love us, that he cared for alcohol more. But what I know today and the understanding that I have of alcoholic, alcoholism is my father left because he did love us. That was the only kind of loving thing he could do because he could not stop drinking. And it was real tough on my mom, you know, being a divorced woman back in the 60s, you couldn't get a, a loan or anything. Uh, it was tough on her, but my mom has worked like a dog and uh I'll be forever, ever grateful for uh, what she has provided for us. But anyway, uh, my friends and I were walking down the street in Hearn, Texas. It wasn't a big deal. Neighbor had his garage door open, and in his garage were these cases of Long Neck Miller beer. I can still see that old gold label on there. This guy couldn't have been an alcoholic because this beer, there was a lot in there, and they had dust and cobwebs all over it. So we went in and stole some of this man's long neck Miller beer. It was in the heat of the summer. It had been sitting out for God knows how long. We went down to my friend's house and opened it up. You know, not the screw on cats anymore. You had to use a can opener. Got it open and it foamed all up and we started sucking off that foam and drinking enough of that hot liquid till we reached that feeling of intoxication, which was almost instantly followed by nausea and vomiting. We didn't have those skills that would come later on. You know how to appropriately coat your stomach before you go out drinking, put your finger down your throat to puke so you could go back and drink some more. Nor did we put a, know about putting one foot on the floor to keep the room from spinning. And that's really important. So we somehow got in the house and, and got in bed and I woke up the next morning with my first hangover. I'm 12 years old, my head is pounding, my eyes are bloodshot, and I don't know what's going on with me. And my friend looked at me and said, my God, Nikki, I'll never do that again. 
and she never did it. The rest of our years in junior high and high school, that girl never tied one on again. She quickly saw what the problem was, made the solution, and didn't do it anymore. I was just as sick as she was, and I said, you're absolutely right. I'll never do that again either. And I never did. I never drank hot Miller beer again. But I couldn't wait to once again experience that sense of ease and comfort that came at once by taking those few drinks. That brief period of intoxication was so elusive that for the next 20 years of my life, I would do whatever I could to experience that again. It somehow just made me okay in my own skin for the first time in my life. And I, I just don't know how any other way to explain it. It was just magic. So we started doing whatever we could uh, to get whatever it was, whether it was robbing parents' um, liquor cabinets or my friend Katie in Austin always talks about the creepy guy at 7-Eleven that'll go in and buy your booze for you. Um, you know, whatever we could to, to get that. And, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about alcoholism. I just knew I didn't want to be like my father. And for all, all purposes, I was far worse than he ever was. Um, so anyway, uh, about the age of 14, I found better living through chemistry. And I started smoking those funny cigarettes. I started taking all those black market pills where you take trips and never leave the room. Want to paint a house without a ladder, lay on the ground, listen to the grass grow. Took a lot of prescription pills. My name was never on the prescription bottle, but I took a lot of prescription pills. And it was not uncommon to find me out in a cow pasture after a heavy rain. When I tell you I'm a real alcoholic, my problem's not alcohol, and my problem's not those other things I do after I've been drinking. My problem is living life sober. I don't like sober. Sober for me was boring. It was depressing, and I would grow restless, irritable, and discontent every time I would get sober. And, uh, you know, it's like the claws of death are just squeezing the air out of your lungs, and you know, I just had to have some relief. Um, I'm so grateful for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that has given me the ability to look back at my life and make some sense of it all. You know, I, I was a blackout drinker. I, you know, I never drank socially, and I've said this at a couple of meetings before. The only thing I ever did socially was spread a little VD, and that was back in the 60s. That's what we most of us did do, you know? I don't know anything about social drinking. I drank to get drunk. I drank to black out. I wanted the full effect and everything I could get out of alcohol. And, uh, you know, I started getting a reputation for being able to drink the football players under the table. And I thought I was just getting cool. Johnny H. in California told me if I'd have gotten any cooler, I'd have froze to death. And I believed that. You know, I, uh, I was drinking these guys and they're all passed out and falling down and I'm still partying. So I thought I was just getting cool. I didn't know I was developing this tolerance to this thing that would ultimately almost destroy me in the end. And I, a lot of bizarre things started happening. You know, I started coming to in places not knowing how I got there. And a lot of things happen to young girls in those situations that we put ourselves in. And I'm not immune to any of that, you know. Um, those things, those things happen, but I, to the best of my ability, I don't let them define my life today. I, uh, you know, it just got so progressive so quickly and I did not understand what was going on. I, I never understood, uh, alcoholism until I came here. But as I was saying, I'm so grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous that gave me the ability to look back at my life and make sense of it all. You know, when I did my first, fourth, and fifth step, I realized in that process that all I ever wanted was to love, to be loved, and to feel important and special and needed. And I didn't learn how to get that in my home. I didn't know how to get that or give that, uh, but I, it was something that I wanted desperately. I think as human beings, we all want that. And what happened for me at the age of 16, just wanting to feel loved and special and needed and wanted, I traded all that for sex. 
And you know, uh, what happened for me is at 16 years of age, I found myself pregnant, not knowing what to do. If you're 16 and pregnant in this day and age, it's not a big deal. But in 1972 in small town, Texas, it was a big deal. My sister who was three years older had moved to Austin where it's a little bit more liberal and I ended up going and staying with her and bringing an illegitimate child into my life. Um, a family, by God's mercy, a family came into my life that said, we will take this child and raise it as our own with a condition you never see this child again. And I had to sign papers agreeing to that. But I did what was best for that child. And it took me 20 years to say, you know, I did what was best for me. Um, I was in no condition. I was a real budding alcoholic. Um, I was in no condition to raise a child. And we, we just couldn't do it. So I did what I thought was best. And uh, I came back to the small town, Texas with a scarlet letter on my forehead. Everyone knew what had happened. And I literally at 16 years of age had to have alcohol or some other chemical in my body that would allow me to walk out on the street and hold my head up and say, I don't care what you think. I don't care. But you see, I'm an alcoholic. I have that built in sixth sense. All anybody had to do was look at me and I knew what they were thinking. And knowing what other people are thinking about me has caused me a great deal of pain in my life and sometimes even today. But what I know from that by working the steps is that I shamed myself to the pit of hell for what had happened. And I was off. I was off to the races. There was not enough alcohol or those other things that I could put in my body to deal with that kind and that depth of pain. You see, what that created in me was a God-sized hole. And there's only one thing you can fill a God-sized hole with. But I had to come to you to learn how to do that. I, I didn't know how to do that. And so I walked around with this, this empty place in my, in my heart. We didn't have counselors on every street corner like we seem to nowadays. And I had no way to deal with that depth of pain and loss. I don't know how I graduated high school. It's nothing shy of a miracle. And uh, I made my first geographical change or cure 45 minutes after I graduated high school. You see, Hearn, Texas was my problem. And if I can just get out of there and go somewhere where no one knows me and I can start over, I'll find me a good man and I'll have children to replace that child because I don't know about this hole in my soul. And I'm going to find me a good man. I'm going to get married. I'm going to be successful. And one day I'll come back and show them off. So I moved to a small town outside of New Orleans, Louisiana, where they party 24 seven. And that was not a good move for somebody like me. I was there two whole weeks and I ended up in jail. And that wasn't the first time I've been in jail, but St. Charles Parish Jail was not a treat, I tell you that. And I stayed in jail. <laughs> I've also heard it doesn't take a genius to get out of jail, it just takes time. <laughs> I stayed in jail long enough to where I finally got out and plan B kicked in. And I ended up marrying the guy I got busted with so he couldn't testify against me and I couldn't testify against him. You gotta have a reason to get married, right? So we took in sick together and of course you know what happens i immediately had a, a child in that in that relationship because i was desperate to fill this boy uh, i had two children from that from that marriage and we i really wanted nothing more than to be a good wife i wanted nothing more than to be a good mother but i'm an alcoholic and those things just don't mix they don't mix I moved back to Texas in 1980, and I like to say I moved because it sounds better than unlawful flight to avoid the prosecution. And uh, it was one of those spiritual moves in the middle of the night where you've got the U-Haul trailer and you're throwing everything in it, heading for that state line. You cross that state line and wipe the sweat off your brow. You're never going back there ever, ever, ever again. And you know, it's a uh, it's kind of okay because you don't know there's a step nine in your future, so you kind of all right. And I came back to Texas and uh, with these two children and a failing marriage, and um, I was it was kind of profound to me when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I heard someone say that it takes two healthy people to have a healthy relationship, and that was profound to me, you know. Um, 
I, I never knew anything about healthy people. And I uh, came back and the marriage would fall apart. And I had these two children and I just wanted to talk about them briefly. When I say, thank God, I don't get what I deserve. I mean that from my soul. Uh, I was trying to take care of these children, but my alcoholism and the other things just continued to progress. By the time I came back to Texas, I had made a lot of really, really poor decisions. And one of those was one night under the influence of alcohol, I let a friend put a needle in my arm. And by the time I got back to Texas, I knew what living one day at a time was long before I came here. And I had to do what I had to do to get what it was that I needed to function. And it was no longer about having a good party or a good time. It was about survival. And I've got these two beautiful children and uh, I wanted nothing more than to be a good mother to them. But I'm an alcoholic mother that goes to the store for a loaf of bread and I don't come back for three or four days, sometimes longer. And I left my children with people children don't need to be left with. And my children heard things no child should ever hear. They saw things that no child should ever see. And they experienced things that no child should ever experience because their mother's an alcoholic. How do you make amends for that? You know, just saying, I'm sorry, just kind of describes your character. Um, thank God. We talk a lot about the grace of God, but there is a mercy of a loving God that would allow us to be able to repair those relationships, you know? And, uh, so I'm wanting nothing more than to, to be a good mother. And I, I, you know, I didn't understand alcoholism. I didn't know about the allergy of the body. I didn't know about the obsession of the mind, but I know when I'm going to the store for a loaf of bread, my car is supposed to turn left and I turn right. I don't want to, I don't mean to. And I come back home after, after my spree and I am sick and I'm torn down and I'm wore out. And I've got these beautiful children with washcloths cleaning their mama up. And they say things to me that I know are the truth. They say, mama, if you don't drink anymore, you won't get sick. And I know that. They're taking genius to figure that out. And I make those promises to them again and again and again. I'm going to stay home with you. You're absolutely right. I'm not going to do that anymore. And I mean that. I mean that. And we're going to go to the park and we're going to play a game and the circus is coming to town and we're going to go. And I mean those things when I say that. And they believe me because they know I'm sincere. But I don't understand what's going on with me. And, it, you know, I start walking off that drunk and, you know, that knot starts in my stomach and it just starts to tighten up and that hand starts to quiver a little bit. And I start to feel like my nerves, like I'm going to fly out of my skin and then the obsession hits and obsession is not that I run through the house like a crazed maniac although on many occasions I have it's just this one thought that comes to my head that says you know Mickey if you take a drink or two it'll calm those nerves it'll quiet that shake and you can go in and play with those kids and when I take that one drink I got to go to the store for a loaf of bread and that happened over and over and over. And I don't understand what's wrong with me. But when that physical allergy is kicked off, um, it is a power greater than myself. You know, I was six years sober when my daughters came to me. And uh, thank God, by the time I was six years sober, my, my daughter had a mother she could come to. But what she came to me with was bring me to my knees one more time. When she was, uh, she had got, she was 14 by the time I was six years sober. She'd gotten into this little relationship, you know, one of those puppy love things. But she had a problem when this guy even tried to hold her hand or touch her. And when she revealed to me the reason that this was the case was because when she was between the ages of four, five, six, seven, eight years old, while I was at the store getting a loaf of bread, she would be repeatedly molested by the neighborhood 15 year old boys. How do you make amends for that? Good God. She allows me to share this story because she knows that we're not the only ones that have experienced this. But I will tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I believe what has happened in our lives has made us closer 
that it could not. And I don't know how to explain that. I just know that the relationship I have with her today is beyond compare. Uh, and I'm so very, very grateful. If you're paranoid and you think they're out to get you, they are. <laughs> and in 1986, they came and got me. And I was charged with a first degree felony punishable by up to 99 years in the penitentiary. They had me on two charges initially. One was, uh, I was just hanging out with my buddies, my pals, my compadres. They call that organized crime. <laughs> they don't like it. And uh, they ended up dropping that and just kept me charged me with the first degree felony. And, uh, you know, uh, I went to jail. I bonded out. I'm one of those alcoholics that gets in trouble when you're in trouble. I can see a few of those on this screen right here. Uh, and I went back to jail and I was held at no bond. And that's a real frightening feeling. I was thinking about that today. You know, when they put you in at no bond, they really don't care. Um, so you stay there quite a while. And I sat in that jail for a long time and literally lost everything that I thought it took to be important and to be successful. My home, my cars, my animals, my everything was gone, uh, including my children. And thank God my ex-husband stepped in and, and uh, took took those kids and my mother. And uh, I, I'm so very, very grateful. And I sat in that jail long enough and I heard that jailhouse talk. And they said, you know, if you go to AA, it looks good when you go to court. So I went to my plea bargain. They offered me 20 years in the penitentiary. And I thought, man, they're a little bit too serious. Don't they know who I really am? And yeah, they did. And uh, so they offered me 20 years and I decided to take it to the box. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that lingo, the box is a, a, jur a jury trial. Now they say it's a jury of your peers, but there wasn't anybody there I'd have hung out with. I'll tell you that. So I've got another court date set. This jury trial's coming up. So I decided to go check out AA. And, uh, you know, I, I went to the Bryan Group of Alcoholics Anonymous and I walked in and you do what you do. You welcome me with open arms and you said, come in. You're the most important person here. I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm facing 99. Of course I'm the most important person here. And they welcome me with open arms and they begin to share what, what their life was like and what happened and what it was like now. And one guy got up and started talking about how his uh, drinking got so bad that his wife left him. And the pain of that was so great that he put the plug in the jug and went to AA and his wife came back and his life was wonderful. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, one wife, one time? I mean, come on. Hang in there. I know women that are Greek with you. Don't give up. But he was talking about true love, and I was so far removed from any of those emotions that I, I didn't know what he was talking about. And some girl jumped up in the back, and she had worked at this minimum wage part-time job long enough to where she uh, saved enough money to get this used vehicle. And, oh, everyone just applauded, you know. And I said, chick, see me after the meeting, man. I'll get you a better deal than that. Might not have a title, but I'll get you a better deal than that. But she was talking about an honest day's pay for an honest day's wage. And again, I am so far removed from that. I have no idea what she's talking about. And I didn't hear the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. And my arrogance and egotism told me I was too bad for AA. And uh, so I didn't stay. You know, um, every time I went to jail, I found God. Always found God when I went when I, when I went to jail, and you know when nobody was looking, I'd lean down, kneel down by that cot, and I'd say that prayer that all of us have said at some time or another: God, please get me out of this one. I'll never do it again. And you mean that? You don't want to lie to God, you know? You mean that? But as soon as they call my name and they open those those doors and they let me out, I leave God locked up in jail. Because I don't know how to God take God with me into my daily life. I don't know how to have a relationship with this power greater than myself. I had to find you, and I had to, I had to come here to learn how to do that. I uh, ended up going to that jury trial. It was terrible. It was ugly. They found me guilty because I was 
And instead of sending me to the penitentiary for 20 years or 99, they came back with a sentence that was probably far worse than anything anybody could do. Now I was prepared to go to prison and do my little turnaround and come back out. Maybe not for 20 years, but I was going to go and do my little turnaround and come back out. But what this jury did was the worst thing you could do to somebody like me. They gave me 10 years intense supervision probation. And I knew they had me. You know, I was so furious. I, let, I left the courtroom that day and did what I needed to do to make it go away for one more day. For God's sake, I'll worry about it tomorrow. But here they're going to be breathing down my neck. They're going to be telling me where I can go, where I can't go, who I can hang out with, who I can't hang out, and pee in a cup, you know? And I knew I was so angry because that was fear. I knew I was never going to stay sober for 10 years. Are you kidding me? And so, you know, I, I left the court. And I got convicted in December of 86, and they told me to start probation on February 5th in 1987. And for those of you that don't remember, my sobriety date is February 5th of 1987. I would love to tell you that going to jail and going through that trial and the many times I've been to jail uh, changed my life. But going to jail never did anything for me but irritate me really bad. Um, I don't like, I don't jail well. Uh, and I, you know, they say when you hit bottom, there's only one way but up. But I'm the, I'm the drunk that hits bottom and I flop around like a fish out of water. You know, I can't go up and I can't put the shovel down. I just keep digging it. And from that time, from December to February 5th, my life was really cratered. I had one, one person who was left in my life and he was a young man. His name was Bud. He was 24 years old. I always liked those younger men. I thought if you got them young enough, you could train them. So you go out to those sordid places. I love Bill say sordid places. It's wonderful. And you see him across the crowded dance floor, you know, and you do what you got to do to reel him in. And then you give him your experience, strength, and hope. But then they get ideas of their own, so you got to get rid of them. But you can't get rid of them until you have another one, right? Sometimes you all three meet in the middle, and that's good for a drunk. Um, but this one young man had hung in there with me. He, he watched me lose everything. And we were living, and when I got out of, of that court, uh, we were living in an abandoned house with no running water and no electricity. I heard a guy in AA say one time, I'd love to tell you that's where alcohol and drugs took me to, but that's where I took me to. Um, and we were, you know, we were destitute. We had, had nothing. And, uh, but he had hung in there with me. And one day he came to me, and I can see it like it was yesterday. And he began to ask me questions what life was about. And he asked the wrong person because I had no clue. And then he asked me what I was going to do. And he asked the wrong person because I had no clue. And then he began to, he made a grave error. He began to point out my failures. He began to remind me that my children were gone. Remind me that I've lost everything. Remind me that I'm doing the exact same thing that got me in all this trouble. And I, I'm still doing it. And I don't know about you, but anytime someone reminds me of my failures, I do whatever I got to do to get you out of my face. If that's attack you physically, I will do that. But what's worse, in my opinion, is attack you verbally. You know, I try to guard my tongue with all that I have today. Because you can make amends for the things that come out of your mouth, but you can never unring the bell. And I began to chop this young man up. I mean, I just let him have it. And he finally looked at me and dropped his shoulders and said, Mickey, I can't live like this anymore. And he started to walk out of, out of my house and out of my life. And I made that grandstand play I had made so many times before. You go ahead and leave, big boy, because I don't need you. I don't need anybody. I don't need anything. And if everyone would leave me alone, I'd be okay. And I believe that. I believe that. But that young man walked out of my life that night, and I went back in and did what I had to do to mix up some more of that poison and make it go away for one more day. I'll worry about it tomorrow. Always tomorrow. 
Tomorrow came, the sun came up as it always does, and I went out find, outside and I found his solution to our problem. And that young man's body hung from a tree with a rope around his neck. And while I was in there making it go away for one more night, he was making it go away for eternity. And a lot of people told me a lot of things about his death. They told me he was a coward, that he couldn't face life on life's terms. Well, I'm gonna tell you what, I'm pretty brave and I'm pretty tough. I got tattoos and scars to prove it. But I couldn't put a noose around my neck and jump. If I could, you'd have a different person here today. I don't believe his death was about being a coward any more than I believe it was about being brave. What it's about is being in so much pain that this illness brings to us that you feel your only solution is death. I know today without a shadow of a doubt, he sits at the right hand of God. And Father Martin says, every one of us that dies from this disease buys sobriety for someone else. Well, I know who bought my sobriety. The price was high. It was real high. I went around like a crazed maniac after looking death in the face that morning. And I'm telling you, I knew I was next. And when you have no God in your life, death is a scary place to consider. And I started running, and I started running, and I started running. And have you ever tried to outrun your head? And uh, I'm going around, I'm psychotic, I'm crazy, I, I don't know what's going on. And uh, finally the gift came. And the gift for me was surrender. And surrender for me happened in the form of a tear. One tear started down my face. Because I'm a tough broad, I don't cry. You know, crying is a sign of weakness. I don't cry. But when that one tear started, it opened the floodgates for years of uncried tears. And I just pulled over and bawled like a baby. And after a while, I sat up and looked around. I don't know how long I was there. And I had this deja vu feeling. And I didn't know what was going on until I saw people walking down the sidewalk carrying this beautiful book called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was outside that stupid AA meeting I had been to many months before. And it was a quarter to eight and people were walking in. Tell me there is no God. I had no intention or thought of ever going back there again. But here I am outside that meeting. They're walking in and I know if I don't get in there, I'm going to die. I know I'm next. And I started up the sidewalk and fell down. It was sometime in January. I don't have a clue. And fell down and literally crawled into what I consider my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd love to tell you that the Brian Group AA members rushed to my side with a plate of donuts and a cup of coffee saying, let us help you up, you poor precious child of God. But they watched the news. They knew what had happened. And they came and looked down their long, skinny noses at me, and they said, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired, and have you had enough? And I was tired. I was tired. I've been running for years, and I was just exhausted. And I had nowhere else to go. And I just took a chair, and I don't remember anything that was said in that meeting, except they said, keep coming back. And I had nowhere else to go, so I just started going to meetings, as many as I could go to three, four, sometimes five meetings a day, because that's what it took for me to somehow stay, stay sober. I didn't, somehow I remembered I was supposed to report to this probation officer. God knows how that happened. That's another God deal. We didn't have cell phones back then. We didn't have a, I didn't have a mailbox. I didn't have any text reminders, but somehow I remembered I was supposed to see this stupid probation officer. And so, uh, I went and reported to her, and she looked at me and, and took one look and said, my God, Mickey, can you do this? I'd been to enough meetings where they told me that this was a, a program of total abstinence. And so I went totally abstinent. And the things I was putting in my body did not appreciate that. And uh, so I went there, and I told her, no, I can't do this. And she tried to find me somewhere to go. And there was nothing available uh, in 1987 for people like me that don't have hospitalization or insurance or $20,000 saved for a rainy day when you want to go to treatment. I, it wasn't an option for me. When Alcoholics Anonymous says they can love you sober, by God, I'm living proof. I sat in those chairs in those AA meetings and I hung on to them and I rocked and rocked and rocked. There were times I literally vomited on myself and you cleaned me up and you gave me some nourishment and you said, honey, as long as you don't put any more of that poison in your body, 
this too shall pass and you never have to go through this again. And I dared to believe you. And I hung on and I dared to believe you. And after about six weeks, the sickness kind of passed and I started feeling a little bit better. And that's the danger zone for me. Because when I feel better, that means I'm sitting in the back of the room. I'm telling everybody how big and bad and tough I am. I'm telling you about those big deals I made out there on the street. You know, I'm trying to get my street cred in an AA meeting. And I'm telling you all this wonderful things. Uh, now I'm not telling you about times I got caught, but I'm telling you about the times I got away with these big deals. And finally, a guy named Charlie. Everybody's got a Charlie. Ricky Russell's probably a Charlie. A guy that got, you know, old time and has got years in the program and has an answer for everything. I found out a lot of these old timers, if they don't know what the answer is, they just tell you it's in the book. <laughs> I say that all the time now, it's in the book. Um, Charlie came to the back of the room and he said, Nikki, why don't you fix your coffee and come sit up front with us? <laughs> I thought, well, they finally want to know what it's like out there on the street. So I went and sat up there next to Charlie who leaned over to me and said, sit here and shut up and listen. And uh, I was so, I couldn't believe he was talking to the most important person at the meeting like that. So I sat there and I shut up and I listened and Charlie saved my life. For the next three months, the only thing they let me say in an AA meeting was to read how it works because there were no cuss words and how it worked. I threw one in every now and then just to kind of liven that thing up. A good friend of mine said when he came into AA, he thought the preamble said Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of mean women. <laughs> I like that. I believe that too. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I just would come to me that I would read how it works and, you know, just with my arrogance and my egotism was just all over the place. And then they made me the greeter at the door. Now you had to really want to be sober when I was the greeter at the door. I don't look anything like I look today. Of course, y'all can't see me, but when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm 5'10", and when I came into AA, I weighed about 115 pounds, soaking wet. I thought I was looking good. I was sunk in places you're not supposed to be sunk in. Um, I had this pasty gray complexion because I hadn't seen the sun in seven years. Uh, you know, I came in with these skin tight blue jeans or these black leather pants tucked in these knee high boots with the brass tip on the end because I was bad. I had these basic black t shirts with the sleeves cut out and the neck cut out because I was hot. I had this big wallet in my back pocket with a dog chain that hung down to my knees and hooked up on my belt because I was tough. And I had a big lot of keys on my hip that made a lot of noise when I walked. You heard me long before you ever saw me. I had a big lot of keys. Now my truck started with a screwdriver and I'm living in an abandoned house, but I got a big lot of keys on my hip because I'm important. <laughs> I had to wear this hat pulled down over my eyes and I had to wear sunglasses because that light was just a little bit too bright in those AA meetings. I had a big leather jacket on with a fringe that hangs down off of it. And uh, I would wear those gloves that don't have any fingers in there. And I would stare at you and do this all through the meeting. Um, all that was about stay away from me. You know, stay away from me. That's close enough. I, I couldn't deal with any more hurt. And, you know, thank God I don't have to live like that anymore today. Um, I went to enough meetings and Charlie kept talking about getting a sponsor, getting a sponsor. So I see a young guy over there with 30 days by the coffee pot. I said, Charlie, I bet he could keep me sober tonight. Charlie said, men work with men and women work with women. And I thought, I hate women. And I hated all women. I know by doing a four step, the reason I hated women is because I thought they were all like me. Uh, isn't that funny? Um, but I, I hated women. One of the things that kept me coming back for a long time was Al-Anon. Because at the First Methodist Church, they had an open meeting downstairs, and upstairs they had a closed meeting and an Al-Anon meeting. And I used to go up to that closed meeting just to terrorize those Al-Anons. You know, I mean, I couldn't stand women, but much less these women, because they were so 
color coordinated. You know, they always had the, this uh, this wet pant suits on, and their pumps always matched their handbag, and they always had makeup on, and their hair fixed. I mean, they looked up just like I do today. <laughs> God, I love it. I love it. And I would just go up there and just terrorize those al -Anons. It, You know, lack of power was not my dilemma for a long time. And uh, Charlie kept talking about getting a sponsor, getting a sponsor. And I became a chronic complainer in AA. You know, I've just been convicted. I'm a convicted felon. I, the, I'm living in an abandoned house. This truck I was driving, I got in a drug deal. Figured it out one day, the truck cost me $12.50 and I got ripped off. When I got busted, the only reason they didn't take that truck is they didn't want that truck, so they didn't take it. And that's how I came to you. So I had a lot to complain about. And I became a chronic complainer and Alcoholics Anonymous. And after a meeting one day, this woman walked up to me and said, Mickey, I want to tell you you're full of shit. And turned around and walked off. I couldn't believe she was talking to the most important person at the meeting like that. And when I went to turn around and tell her that, my mouth opened and this voice like mine said, will you be my sponsor? And Linda K turned around and looked at me from the top of my head to the tip of my toes and square in the eye. And she said, I don't like you, but I'll help you because I have to stay sober. Well, la ti da, you know? She said, do you have a big book? I said, no. She said, do you have any money? I said, no. She said, well, steal one. You can make amends later. So I did. And um, I would complain about things enough. And she was ruthless and heartless. Didn't care about my feelings at all. And I would complain. And she'd say, get a job. So I went to the noon meeting. And they said, are there any AA-related announcements? I said, yes, I need a job. And by the time that meeting was over, I had my first sober, a sober job. And I went to work on an assembly line in a sweatshop, 120 degrees, and uh, drilling holes in marble sinks as they came down the assembly line. But I learned about punching a time clock. I learned about being on time. I learned about a day's pay for a day's wage. And when I went to that meeting and uh, when I got my first paycheck and I put my dollar in the basket, I got a standing ovation for my home group. You know, uh, I was so happy. And they said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I started being able to give. My probation officer has been very influential in my life. She helped me get back into school uh, where eventually I got some initials behind my name that led me into a career that I've had uh, since that time. And Thank God I don't get what I deserve. You know, I, I am so spoiled. I, I just really am so spoiled. Um, I got really involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. In the first 15 years I was sober, every weekend I was in a prison somewhere, taking me into the prison. I got involved with the h and &I committee, and they said, you know, if, if the Lions Club wants to know about AA, I'm your girl. I'm going. If the Rotary Club wanted to know, take me, I'm going. I'm going into treatment centers and prisons and jails. I'm doing all this because I don't want to die. I don't want to drink. I'm loving what I'm getting out of this program. And, uh, you know, after three and a half years of that probation, the judge called me in his chambers and he said, Mickey, I hear about the good works you're doing in the community. And I believe you're a changed person. And I'm releasing you from the bondage of the state of Texas. And I couldn't believe it. I'd been convicted by a jury. And here he is uh, letting me go. I did become a changed person. You know, step one is my problem statement. Step two is my solution. And step three, my sponsor said, you've got a decision to make. Keep doing what you're doing and leave us alone or try life on a spiritual basis. And if I'm going to try life on a spiritual basis, that means I've got to get busy on a fourth step. By this time, I had worked enough and, and had lived into an apartment, moved into an apartment where it was $200, all bills paid. Woohoo! I was uptown. It was in Crack Alley. I had to literally hold my breath when I got out of my vehicle to run in my apartment and close the door because I didn't want to test positive when I went to probation. But you can get sober wherever you are. I'm a firm believer in that. And, uh, you know, now I live in a beautiful home, uh, you know, just material things, but you know, it's just, it's just amazing. 
So, uh, you know, I've worked my way into middle management uh, at a nonprofit organization, and I have been there quite a while. And I worked hard. I, I, I worked hard. Um, school was hard. I had children. My children had, were back living with me. And I worked hard. And, uh, but I made meetings every day. I plan my life around recovery. I don't plan my recovery around my life. You know, it, it's central to me because if I'm not sober, I can't have anything else. I can't have the, the good gift uh, of, of life. But when I did that first, fourth, and fifth step, you know, I, I can remember it like it was yesterday. My sponsor sent me home after the fifth step for that hour of careful consideration. And during that hour, I had to go to the restroom. And when I went to the restroom and turned that light on, I saw who was looking back. I saw my reflection in the mirror and it was like I saw me for the first time. And I saw what a despicable, inconsiderate, manipulative, dishonest, selfish, self-centered person I had been my entire life. The miracle for me happened in steps six and seven because for the first time I know what's wrong with me and with your direction and with God's strength, I can change. And I started changing and I started working hard. And I, I just started loving this life and I love the power that I could feel flow in me and keep that power. And I'd love to tell you that I've had that power for 35 years, but I'm a human being. I lose it, but I know how to get it back. It's so simple. A few steps and you get, you get right back plugged in. And I like being plugged in. Uh, that ninth step, you know, I thought I was going to have to move away because I had too many connections and too many, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the old timer said, you will stay here and you will look this community in the eye and you will pay back what you've done. And by doing that is the only reason I believe that judge let me off probation early because I became a different person. I was reborn. We just read that a few minutes ago. I was reborn, you know, and uh, my life took on a whole different meaning. I am uh, my probation officer, again, influential in my life. She said, I want you to take some further action. And I've, I've taught to take the action, leave the results up to God. And in 1994, I received a full pardon from the governor of the state of Texas. Now, what is that about? Do I need that for my ego? I'm sure you can tell I don't. But I knew that God had some purpose in this. And I had worked at that nonprofit organization uh, at about 20, 22 years ago. We had major funding cuts in the state of Texas. And whenever you have major funding cuts, the first thing that goes is middle management. So about 22, 23 years ago, I was without a job. I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, I was unemployed about three days, and I uh, got a phone call and a familiar voice said, hey, I hear you're looking for a job. And I said, yes. And she said, why don't you come work with us? And that familiar voice was my probation officer. I, I, I just retired from adult probation, making a career out of working at adult probation where I was on probation. Um, that doesn't happen. And I know the only reason I work there is because of that pardon. They don't hire convicted felons. And uh, I got that pardon and, uh, you know, I believe God put me exactly where he wanted me to be. Because for the last 24 years of my life, I worked really, really, really hard to keep people out of jail and prison for alcohol and drug use. Was able to implement a lot of programs and was involved in drug court. And, uh, you know, we really made a difference in a lot of people's lives. Things have been phenomenal. Uh, I could go on for another hour, but I promise you I won't. Just a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, I got a phone call when I was about three and a half years sober. And uh, I was asked to come give my probation officer her one-year chip. My probation officer had not told me she was sober, so I felt really awkward, and I said, no, I don't think I could do that. And uh, I got off the phone with her friend, and the phone rang. I picked it up, and it was my probation officer. And she said, Nikki, will you please come give me my chip? She said, had I not seen Alcoholics Anonymous work in your life, I wouldn't be sober today. So we never know who's watching. We never know who's looking at us. 
when I went into her office to talk to her, I talked about me. I didn't talk to her about her. And how, how amazing is that, that we are walking examples of, of this program and of this book, you know? And we never know who's watching. So don't be a bad example of AA is all I have to say. Um, things have just gone on so well. And, and I, Clancy always said, I'd love to tell you every day has been a holiday and every meal has been a banquet, but that's not the truth. I was six years sober and I was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. I was given eight months to a year to live. Obviously, that didn't happen. I ended up at MD Anderson Hospital. And um, those, those people saved my life. I had this young doctor. Oh, he was so cute. He was Italian. Oh, my God. And I had a horrible cancer. Um, I had colorectal cancer, stage four at 38 years old. And I'm like, why can't this be a wart on my finger instead of a tumor up my butt, you know? <laughs> really cute doctor. And I went in one day and I told him, I said, Doc, I know why I got this cancer. He said, Mickey, you're too young. There's no way. It's got to be genetic somewhere down the line. I said, no, Doc, I'm telling you. He said, why? I said, from so many years of men blowing smoke up my butt. We got to know why. And it made perfect sense to me, you know? And so I uh, uh, went in there with, uh, with an uh, open mind and I did radiation and I did chemotherapy. I lost every hair on my body, had to fight the lesbians off. And I did a lot of other things. Uh, I did hands-on healing. I did Reiki. I slept on beds of magnets. I drank aloe vera juice. I have angels. I have feathers. I burn sage. I have crystals. I went to churches where people talked in tongues and fell out on the floor. You know, saying music and praise God. Because if somebody came by and said, I believe this will help you, I'm in. It wasn't important whether I believed it or not, but you believed it. And there's power in whatever you believe, just like there was power in the lies I believe. You know? So yes, I'm in. Let's go. And all I can tell you, people ask me all the time, what worked? It all worked because I'm alive and I'm free of cancer. You know, thank God for that. And, uh, you know, I had a friend came by the house and he said, Mickey, are you angry with God? And I said, why would I be angry at God? He said, well, you have this horrible cancer and you might die. I was so grateful I had done the work. That I no longer had God on some throne looking down saying, you know, Mickey looks like she's doing okay. Let's flick some cancer on her and see how she handles that. Because if I believed God was doing that, then God's my problem. And God can't be my problem and my solution at the same time. What is my choice to be? And when I didn't know if I was going to live or die from that thing, uh, my, my, my prayer was always, Father God, however this journey must end, allow me to walk with the grace and dignity of a sober woman alcoholic that you have allowed Alcoholics Anonymous to instill in this, in this child of yours. You know? I don't know what's always going to happen. I just know that if I keep turning the pages of this book and doing what is suggested uh, by a sponsor and what's on the pages of this book, that wonderful things are going to happen. I expect miracles. I expect them and I see them all the time. I'm a miracle junkie and I just love it. Um, it was also about 20 years ago when I got a phone call. Well, I got an email. Uh, we didn't have Facebook and all that stuff back then. And uh, so I emailed this young woman who lives in Sugarland, Texas, and I uh, emailed her quite a while. And, and uh, then we talked on the phone, and then my daughter went at night, went to meet Kimberly in Sugarland. And Kimberly's the daughter I gave up for adoption in 1972. Tell me there's no God. And that happened in God's time, not in my time. It has nothing to do with me making that happen. And I just got a message from her. She's going to be down here this next weekend. You know, thank God I don't get what I deserve. And I have all my children in my life. And I get Mother's Day cards from all of them, you know. And and uh, that hole has been filled. It was filled long before this happened. But that God-sized hole was filled with God. And uh, I'll be forever grateful for this journey where it's taken me so far. And expect it to go on. You know, good things are going to happen. I'm coming to Mississippi. You know, good things are going to happen. 
And I'm probably not what I should be, and I'm probably not what I could be, but thank God in AA, I'm not what I used to be. Thank y'all for having me. I'll never do another Zoom, Ricky Russell. <laughs>